One of the things you mentioned during the presentation has to do with watching out for specimen damage if you include volunteers to help you with um, with taking down the records. Um, we have the same sort of problem and what has actually happened is we have been stopped from using volunteers at all to handle the specimens any specimens whether type or the usual yeah. specimens because of that i'd like to ask what strategies what sort of training can we offer people before uh, okay firstly to convince the um, to convince my boss that we can still do this if we train train them in train them right CD. yeah and also to gain confidence in them that they can now do this. How can we, what do we need to do? It's a very difficult call, I think. So I guess personally what I would be doing, so I, I mentioned we have the luxury of typically working with students who, you know, they're interested in becoming scientists or, you know, they're, they're interested in the area for one, but then also they had some basic preparation already happening. So they have been through some of the general entomology classes, so they had to collect their own specimens and pin some of the insect specimens and label them. So A, they realize how much time it takes to actually prepare a specimen. So they have much more of that perspective of having respect for what you're handling there. And then also they have, I think, the, the, you know, the physical skills because they've been handling specimens for a bit. So I think maybe this is one way of doing that. If you have some, you know, I want to call them trash specimens, every museum has some you know, bulk things that you know, never got prepared and don't have labels and stuff like that. So just as the first few days or half days or something like that, just have people prepare some of these specimens. And that will tell you how good they are really with you know, handling things and being careful about reading the instructions and, and working with you. So it's, again, it's time consuming for us obviously to do that because you know, we need to keep a close eye on that. But I think that might be the way to go. And then you know, just have them work on, again, not so important specimens first. I think that's typically what I do too. So you know, I'm not even talking about types. I'm just talking about rare, rarer species or something like that. So I would, you know, we have like Ligus hesperus or something where we have thousands of specimens. Well, m mostly also, you know, long series from the same, from the same place, from the same plant, they're pests and everything. So, you know, we try to put, when people start working for us, we put them on, you know, species like that. So they have to go through, you know, a hundred specimens of stuff that, you know, if one of them breaks, we're, we're not going to be crying too much over that. So I think that would be my strategies, and you know, be careful with them. Okay, I know probably technology can fail you at a point. So then, how did, how then do you go and cover your data? If you do the the whole drawer, so you know you could so the OCR thing, the optical character recognition, would be one thing essentially, where you take each of these subdivided draw images and then optically recognize each of the elements. And then, and again, Melissa is gonna be talking about it with more detail because it actually works for the botanical people because their labels are more structured, they're bigger and so on and so forth. And then the computer program, that optical recognition program just drops these individual text elements into the fields. So it essentially automatically fills out the database. For insects, no one has managed to make it work at any level because you know, often they're not typed and handwriting, optical recognition for handwriting, it's one of the more difficult things out there to do. But then that crowdsourcing thing is really, so you essentially make the image or that part of the image with the label that you want transcribed, you make that available to a volunteer and a volunteer then sits there and says, okay, it says USA, so that's a country. And that person types in the information into the country locality field. And then it says, doesn't that state and uh, um, county and so on and so forth. And a volunteer just you know, types all the information in there. So it's essentially, it's manual data entry. We're just not paying for it. 
because we're really trying to get you know the citizen scientists out there excited about things and they help us do that. Obviously you have the same issues with quality control, training, you have to keep a very close eye on that people actually know what they're doing when they're transcribing data because otherwise you end up with a lot of garbage in and garbage out. So it's it's a it's a fairly point new. Why does everybody point at me when they say garbage in? So what? <laughs> Why does everybody point at me when they say garbage in? <laughs> because you said it so enthusiastically the first day that you know. <laughs> um, I have another question. Um, you see, there was an example where you say you could start by having an image per species in a big collection as, as a way of getting encouraged yeah. about this whole digitization. Um, are there any existing guidelines on selecting the particular species, specimen, specimen that you're going to use? Because I'm looking at a situation where you have a draw with, um, <laughs> with butterflies yeah. and it's one species, but you have the males and the females with different colors right, right, and right. you have also the seasonalities. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So, so what we typically do in cases like that um, is uh, if there's sexual dimorphism, if the males and females look difficult, uh, different, not difficult, <laughs> different, <laughs> too much talking, um, we would capture an image of both. We select one male, one female. And then also what I would, that's more what I definitely would do for research, maybe not quite as much for you know, streamlined databasing, but it would be a good idea for that too. And we started doing that for certain, for certain taxa. If you see, polymorphism of any kind, seasonal or geographic or whatever, we would select multiple specimens to try to represent what we think is that particular taxon, that particular species. So then how do you select among those? And well, we just go for the prettiest specimen. <laughs> that, and that really depends on the taxa you're looking at. Redivids are fairly sturdy, big bugs. And they don't lose their legs and appendages, antennae, things very easily. But then I also work on plant bugs and they're extremely delicate. So you look at them the wrong way, they're losing their appendages. So making sure that they have most of their legs and antennae, that's obviously a priority. Then you want to have specimens that, as far as you can tell, are not completely faded, for example, because you obviously see that too, or otherwise damaged so that um, things are obscured. So I would go for, you know, completeness, beauty, and then best representation of that particular taxon by choosing exemplars in the different sexes and polymorphisms or morphs. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I have another question. Um, yesterday we learned about VertNet and you brought up InvertNet. Um, is InvertNet a portal that you can join and have your data on it or it's something It's something different, yeah, it's, it's, it's very confusing. There's so many terms out there and everything means some, something different. So InvertNet is just a, it's the name of a project that would be equivalent to the project we're working on. So they're all under the umbrella of advancing digitization projects that were funded by the uh, U.S. National Science Foundation over the last few years. And um, that particular InvertNet project, so goal of 60 million specimens um, imaged or data-based or data accessible in some way. Um, and they're really working with a total of 33 collections. Their focus also is really of the Midwestern United States. So that's one of the problems with all these ADBC projects, and that's a sad thing, really. They're very much focused on biodiversity in North America, which on one hand, projects. yeah, they're all national projects, which in a way obviously is a good thing because you think there's a lot of biodiversity that's not known out there in, in North America. So trying to get a really comprehensive picture is a good idea, and this is what these projects are trying to do. So InvertNet, at this moment in time, but that not this moment in time is an important thing, you can't really just join and, and um, work together with them and make your data available through them. 
But their plan is obviously to come up with resources and platforms that over the next 10 years or so will be available to everyone out there pretty much. And then it will be, you know, their, their final goal is to essentially image all the drawers in all the collections worldwide. So but obviously this is not funded at this moment in time. So at the moment it's just initiatives that are under research uh, for later. Well, it's, it's an initiative of 33 museums in North America. So similar as the project we're working on is a collaboration of 34. Actually, I think we're down to 33 too. So it's a, it's a different set of collections working together.